Hello again. Today we'll be looking at sampling distributions. Sampling distributions forms the basis for inference that we'll be performing in the next few weeks of this uh, of this course. So inference means dealing with parameter values and trying to make some decisions about parameter values, and that critically depends on the distributions we'll be looking at today. So let's have a look at the first part, introductions. First of all, we'll first look at why we sample, because sampling is part of what's going on here as far as uh, the uh, distributions are concerned. We don't often get data from the whole population as such. We sample. And the reasons for sampling, we will see as we go through. How we need to be careful of what biases we can introduce by sampling and then work out the distributions we're going to deal with. So those things are what we'll be looking at today. So, first part. Often we get information not from all, all the individuals in the population, or all the subjects in the population, but from a sample. And for example, if I want the mean income of Australians, or proportion of voting labor at the next election, or the market share of a company, PhD Bilton, proportion of faulty items produced by a machine or by a particular company, the mean weight of a packet of cereal, all these things here are population quantities. But we want the income of all Australians, proportion of all voters that will vote Labour, proportion of all faulty items. Now, of course, the only way I can get this uh, particular, all these things I'm looking at earlier here, if I measure every unit, if I ask every voter who they vote for, I'll get the exact answer. But of course, that's what happens in the election. If I take a look at every packet of cereal, I can find the mean weight. Now, the problem is, of course, this is quite a bit of work. So, what we're looking at here, as far as measurements are concerned, is measuring every unit in the population. That's what we call a census. And census are expensive. It's costly. It takes time. And it's difficult to conduct. That's why it happens only every five or ten years in most countries. Now, in some cases, I actually can't measure everything, because measurements can be destructive. If I want to test a match for quality, whether it's a good match or a bad match, I like it, and I've lost it. So when, when, if I'm looking at, say, for example, safety for cars, I crash the cars, but I've lost the car, then I've damaged it. So I can't test everything all the time. And in some, in some cases, I can't do, do it at all. For example, if I want to know how much gold I've got in this next deposit I'm looking at, the only way I'll know is after I've dug the whole thing up, what I'd like to know before I do that. So how can I work it out? If I want to take in populations of wild animals, for example, I can't kiss them all. There must be other ways of doing that, and that's a very smart way of doing these things. So how do you proceed in these situations? Well, of course, the idea is sampling. We don't look at every individual in the population. We look at a subset of the population. And then what we are saying is that what we see in the sample is exactly the same as we will see in the whole population, with a reason. Now, of course, this requires care. So as we saw earlier in the course, biases can be, can be introduced. We must make sure we select the sample carefully so it represents the whole population. Otherwise, we get bias. Now, we did cover some biasing ideas before. The basic ideas we would cover there earlier. The important aspects were self-selection bias, for example, where the individuals select themselves in the sample. So the researcher doesn't pick the individuals, but the individuals themselves pick themselves to be part of this. So TV polls and other such Online polls are typical examples of this. And if I conduct telephone polls and call people up, of course, the problem is I'll only get people with telephones, landlines maybe, and who are actually available when I do call them. So there are problems of these kinds. <coughs> Some definitions. Population is the set of all units of interest. A parameter is some quantity that is part of the population, some measure, like a mean or variance or proportion. And a sample is simply a subset of the population. Now, there are many sampling schemes. You'll find whole books full of them, whole library shelves full of them. We'll take a look at some very simple examples over here. But in particular situations, you'll need particular sampling schemes. One important aspect here is randomization. I need to have some aspect of a random selection over here.
so that every unit is picked at random in some way. And then we will have to have some probability models. The reason for probability models is I'm not interested in just the sample itself. I'm interested in how the sample links or relates to the whole population. In particular, I know if I pick a different sample, I'll get different answers. So I want to know how the, the variation between samples, how can I quantify that? So how does it work? <clears throat> well, if I'm looking at, at proportion of voters who will vote liberal in the next federal election, I ask a random sample of N voters, and then X of them will say they will vote liberal. So my sample proportion is X over N. And I use this to estimate the true population. Now, the problem, of course, here is that can I assume that at the next federal election, P hat of the voters will actually vote liberal? So what are the assumptions involved here? We assume, or we will pick the sample in such a way that it represents the population of voters. And of course, I know that different samples will give me different results. So there's some sampling variation that just cannot be removed. Sampling variation is there all the time because it's sample dependent. But I want to quantify this. And how do I know if my sample results and your sample results are different only because of sampling variation? In other words, my sample is different from your sample. So are the differences that I'm seeing in the results only because of sampling variation or is there something else happening? In other words, if I take a sample this week and a sample in two weeks' time and there are different results from there, is it because of sampling variation or because the voters have changed their mind? So in this case, I'm looking at a different sample at a different point in time. I want to know if the results are different because of only sampling error or because voters actually have changed their mind. And that's important for me to know. So, probability models. We'll deal with some simple models over here. Again, as I say, this thing is quite complex. Sampling is quite complex and a large part of statistics. But the simple, simple things is what we will look at over here. The quantity of interest, such as in this case, for example, the mean weight of a box of cereal or the whole population of a box of cereals, voting preference, survey, and that quantity is a population uh, quantity and it has some distribution. We call that population distribution. A parameter is anything of interest. So if I'm looking at, say, a salary, and I assume that's a normal distribution, then that has a mean and a variance. So there are two parameters. The distribution here, population distribution is normal. The parameters are mu and sigma squared. A sample is simply a subset of this. So I model of, of the population, and I model that as, first of all, I want independence, because that makes things simple. And I'm assuming that these things, the units I'm having a look at, are exactly all the same in distribution. So the values will be different, but the distribution is, is the same. So independent and identically distributed. We abbreviate that to IID, random variables. So my sample essentially is modeled as an IID set of random variables, x1 to xn. They have the same distribution as x, which is population distribution. The simplest form of sampling is what we call simple random sampling, where every unit in the population has the same chance of being selected. Now, in practice, population distribution is known or assumed to be known, but the parameters will not be known. So, in my usual case of a normal distribution with mean, mu, and variance sigma squared, what I'm going to assume is population has this distribution normal, but these two quantities are not known usually. And the only information I have about those two parameter values, mean and sigma squared or the other parameter values, is what I get from the observed data. There's nothing else to help me here. And all estimation and inference is based on population model and the data. So estimation is getting the values of parameters, and inference is determining or deciding on the values as being correct or different from previous or whatever else. As an example, if I conduct a political poll and I ask N voters who they'll vote for, if they support the government, X of them say yes, then X here is binomial NP. N is known to me because I've sampled N voters, 
but the parameter P here is unknown. And so P here is proportion of voters who support the government. The question is, how do I estimate this proportion? And how accurate is my estimate? How do I select sample size, for example, in particular, if I want a particular accuracy, I might require a particular sample size. And how, do, how large a sample do I need in this case? So some other technical words here, just to introduce ideas. This word statistic here, a statistic is just something that comes from the data. So if I take a look at a sample mean, that's a statistic. Sample bearing is also a statistic. So this sample mean x bar here is a random variable because it depends on these random observations that are in my sample. Once I have my sample, I get the observed value that comes from the data. I work out the numbers. Likewise, the sample variance is a random variable because I've got a random randomization here, randomness in my sample itself. But once I have the data, I can work out the value here. So the uppercase letters as before are random variables, and the observed observe values are lowercase letters. So these are two common statistics we know, and we've seen before. As an example, let's take a look at trying to work out the mean product weight. So I select n items, and let x denote the weight of a randomly selected item. I'm assuming here population distribution is normal, and these are the two parameters. So my random sample x1 to xn, the IID, independent and identically distributed, normal with the mean mu and sigma squared as the variance. That's my sample in this case, and that's why I'm modeling it. There's a problem here then. If the weight of the boxes of a serial are uh, assumed to be normal with mean 500 and standard deviation 500 of, of 5 grams, so if I know this is the situation, if I select a random sample of 25 boxes, What's the probability the sample mean there is less than 495 grams? So I'm asking essentially this question, probability x bar is less than 495. But to compute this, I require the distribution of x bar. And that's what sampling distributions are all about. So what's the sample dist distribution of the sample mean? Let's use simulations. So if I take a look at this situation of 500 grams as the mean and 25 as the variance or 5 as the standard deviation, and I sample in this case 25 boxes. So I've got here my sample size is 25. And I've sampled this many times. And I have a histogram here. This is the histogram of sample means. Sorry, excuse me. This is this is a this is a histogram of the data itself. Here is a, is a sample of the data. The mean is five hundred grams. The variance is twenty five. And I've I've got a sample, and I'm taking a look at the histogram of this. If I take a look at exactly the same situation. Samples of size 25. And I take a look at the sample mean. And I plot that. And I take many such samples. What I find is, my original data looks like that. This is just one single sample. So I take many samples of size 25 and I get this histogram. This is how my actual weight of the boxes looks like. But this is what the means look like. I have a, here many means, 10,000 or so means, each of size 25. So I take 10,000 samples of size 25, work out the sample means, and I plot them. The two things you notice here are, first of all, that this is much narrower much narrower, very little spread compared to this. The second thing is, the mean is still the same, it's still centered at 500. 
In fact, the variance of standard deviation here is 5, and standard deviation here is 1. Now let's look, look at this in more detail in the next slide. So both histograms are centered at 500, which is the mean of the normal distribution I started off with. Both look normal. That's where this was normal to start off with. But the sample mean also looks normal. And thirdly, the sample mean histogram, the second one, is much narrower and spread. In fact, if I look at it, the sample size was 25, my standard deviation was 5 for the original data, and the standard deviation of the means is 1, which is actually S on 25. So it works out to be 5 on root 25. 5 was my original standard deviation here, so it's S on root N. It looks like there's this result here that's happening. We can formalize that. So here's the important result. I've got x1 to xn b i i d. This is my sample of random variables. I haven't assumed here any distribution yet, but I've got a mean there and a variance there. And so this is the mean and variance of the population. So every of these random variables here, we assume have the same mean and same variance. And I look at the sample mean x bar in the usual way. The mean of the sample mean, x bar here, is just the same as what I started off with, mu. But the variance is sigma squared upon n. So the individual observations over here have mean mu and variance sigma squared. But the sample mean has the same mean, but the variance is much smaller here. And of course, as I increase my sample size, this becomes smaller and smaller which means that the values are going to be very much closer to mu itself, because the spread is quite small. So the proof here, I won't go through this in detail, but just to point out that all we're going to be using here is properties of the expectations and variances as we saw earlier. So here is e of x bar, x bar is 1 over n times the sum, and I know that in this case I can exchange the summation with expectations, so it says 1 upon n times the sum, sum of the expectations, the means here are all mu each, and I've got n of those I'm adding, I get n mu, the n's cancel out, I get mu out of this. For variance, a similar thing happens, I'm assuming independence. The main thing I have to watch out for here is the n comes outside, but it gets squared first, because it's a constant. And then because of independence, I can simply add variances. So this is again n variances, n sigma squared, I'm adding constant sigma squared n times. And you can see here, what I get is this extra factor of n, because this n was squared, and there's no such squaring happening here. The variance is get squared. So sigma squared upon n is what I get over there. So just be careful. The sample mean is the average from a sample. It's a random variable because its value depends on the sample chosen. I change the sample, I change the value of this. The observed value comes from the data I've collected. Population mean mu. X bar there, small x bar mu. It's a constant at any point in time. It may change with time, but that's not a constant at the moment. Still, it's a constant for the, for the population. It's usually unknown, but the symbols I'm using are different, so be careful. X bar is sample mean, and mu is population mean. We'll stop there, and we'll take it up the next time. Thank you.